Well, hi, this is John Sarver, and uh, welcome to a uh, uh, my geothermal story tonight. And uh, this is sponsored by GLREA and the Michigan Solar Users Network. And uh, Alan Waller uh, is going to speak to us tonight and give us an introduction to geothermal heating and cooling. Uh, Alan is the uh, uh, Michigan Territory Manager for Water First International, you know, Water Furnace International, and is also on the board of uh, directors for the uh, for GLREA. Uh, please keep yourself muted until we get to the question and question and answer period. And uh, with that, let me turn the, uh, uh, the screen over to you, Alan. Go ahead. Hey, thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me again. Uh, talk about geothermal heat pumps. Um, I've been involved with um, the heating and cooling industry since the early 80s. Um, graduated from Macomb Community College in the climate control and energy management uh, program. Uh, worked out in the field and then uh, become a licensed contractor, mechanical contractor and a licensed builder. Um, been involved with wholesale industry over 30 years and now been with Water Furnace for 12. Um, really enjoy the, the, the purpose of renewable energy and the products that we provide. And I have tonight a little PowerPoint presentation on geothermal 101 and it's basically basically just the basics of um, of geothermal heat pumps and how it got started so um, back in the history here of um, of our company and um, energy systems formed in 1980 uh, the Jennerson's energy systems and then later became water furnace in 83 and uh, also there's the ground source heat pump association that came in effect in 87 and that was part of Oklahoma State University and they did a lot of training and not only training but uh, testing and uh, building up um, um, data for us to to use. Um, now Alan you know we can't see the uh, you haven't started screen sharing yet uh, just uh, oh sorry hang on a second okay me, uh, my, my fault Let me, uh, let me try that again then. I'm gonna share screen and then I'm gonna go back up to this one. How come? Oh, there we go. Uh, it's not full screen yet, but uh, it's coming. There it is. Yep, super. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry about that. My fault. Um, so here we are, introduction to um, geothermal, part of the MySolar slash geothermal. Uh, brief history here. Basically, it started back in 1912. It was a, it had a Swiss uh, patent back then, and they used an open loop geothermal systems and they've been successfully used even in the 30s. Um, Edison Electric sponsored closed loop research in the 40s and 50s. And then just lack of the materials also slowed some interest in providing that. Um, again, in the 70s with the Swedish, they started investigating geothermal closed loop systems and using uh, plastic pipe. Um, history of water furnace. Now we started in, in 1980 as Genesis Energy Systems and then became Water Furnace International in 1983, uh, based in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And then we're part of the ICSPA Association, uh, the Ground Source Heat Pump Association out of Oklahoma University. And then uh, also they have the Geothermal Heat Pump Consortium. Uh, it's a nonprofit group, uh, consists of a lot of the manufacturers, utilities, and so forth. And then um, defining the geothermal, temperature geothermal, plant reservoirs. I'm gonna be referring to low temperature geothermal and that refers to shallow earth temperatures found anywhere and using tubing or actually groundwater or ponds to transfer heat from the ground or uh, vice versa. Um, so we're a water to air product or water to water and we could do 
heat like a boiler or heat and provide forced air heating and cooling. And we're putting plastic pipe buried below the earth surface or we're placing it in a pond. We also can utilize the well water in place of the earth loop. And that averages about two gallons per minute per ton. So an average home might have a four ton system. We're gonna move about eight gallons a minute as we run our system and have a place to dispense of that water, either into a pond or a dry well or back down into the, into the aquifer where it came from. Um, so the earth does so serve as a huge giant solar collector and it does store heat energy. Air temperatures may fluctuate as much as 50 degrees above and below the annual average, but only a few feet below the earth, we're gonna have constant temperatures so during the heating season, we're, we're, we also uh, serve the earth as a heat of extraction. So we're pulling heat from the earth and then bringing it into the, our, our, our furnace and transfer it into the home. And in the cooling season, we're taking the heat from the house and we're putting it back into the earth with this heat of rejection. And that's our source when we're out at the, and then that's our sink. So during the winter time, we're using the source of the earth as our source for the heat. And then during the summer, we're using that as a sink to get rid of the heat. Um, we're usually putting the earth loop down horizontally or vertically, and it can be also placed in a pond. We're using a water and antifreeze based uh, methanol type solution. That's usually about 10% of the total uh, water. So um, in the loop. And an average loop might have 80 to 100 gallons. So you might have 10 gallons of methanol in the system to keep it from freezing. And again, it takes heat transfers from the heat pump into the water to the refrigerant through the heat exchanger called a coax coil. So a geothermal has a, a few different circuits and, it, and four of them actually, distribution, where we're gonna move uh, the conditioned air or water through the home and building. We have the refrigerant circuit, similar to your refrigeration at home or your refrigerator, and it's sealed. It's a, pr a pressurized sealed circuit. We're using 410A, and we'll be advancing in the new refrigerants in the near future. Then we have the ground loop circuit, and the ground loop circuit is basically buried out in the ground. And we average on a horizontal loop of 400 to 800 foot of tubing per circuit in a horizontal loop. And on a vertical loop, you might be around 400 to 600 foot, depending how, you know, if you go to a 200 or a 300 foot uh, deep well. Um, we also could do domestic hot water with a geothermal unit. And we could do it with the forced air system and we call that a desuperheater or we can have a separate unit that does strictly hot water as a domestic hot water, or we could use it in for heating also. So these circuits are closed and sealed. There's no direct mixing of either of all of or the, the systems, but we do transfer the heat in through the refrigeration circuit and the water circuit, basically is where we're transferring the heat. And then the refrigerant flow through the compressor changes directly Directions. So we have the distribution circuit, your refrigeration circuit, earth loop, and your hot water circuit. And they all work in conjunction with the refrigeration circuit. Here's a heating mode operation where it shows here, here's our operation of a forced air blower, supply air, your return air. And then we got the water loop coming out here and going through a reverse return header and through the earth and then back into our heat pump. And then we could also then take and connect to the unit and do our hot water as with the D superheater. And that's in the heating mode. And then we get into the cooling mode, we reverse that flow. So now the water is coming back in, the, in our loop and coming back the opposite way. And we're uh, and dispensing and, and, and getting rid of the heat that way. Instead of absorbing the heat from the earth, we're rejecting it. So it's heat of rejection. And all these are tested under different standards and we meet AHRI and ARI in, in plastic uh, uh, loop um, 
uh, regulations and so forth. Basically, the plastic we're using is an SDR 11 pipe, and it's similar of the gas piping they use in putting in the ground, and they use a fusion of 450 degrees to fuse and connect those fittings together. And normally, you don't have any leaks, and we have guaranteed these for over 55 years and still um, haven't had any troubles. So uh, they're just showing the groundwater is a more constant too, by the way, if you're using an open loop situation. And then um, these are different standards that they did testing water temperatures coming in, water temperatures for heating and, uh, and so forth. And then the cooling as far as the loop and so forth. So ARI does do a nice efficiency ratings. And a lot of times we do have to provide the AHRI certificates to the electric co-ops for our, our rebates and so forth to show that the unit does meet the energy efficiencies, EER ratings for cooling and COP, coefficients of performance. EER is energy efficiency ratings, and it's a little different than the SEER ratings that you see in air conditioning. And reason being is that we're using and putting our unit on a load and actually making it provide the cooling under 85 degree load and where the other system doesn't have that under uh, an air conditioner for some reason they don't put it under a load when they do their testing but these are the ratios or the way of that we rate our performance of our equipment and and again theirs is called seasonal energy efficiency radiate ratio and that's over the cooling system and then their heating side is the heating season performance factor and that's measure of their heating performance efficiencies over the course of the season. So thermodynamics, heating and cooling, basically it, it's, it's what we're doing and it doesn't cost anything. And it, it's the first law is energy moves and it's conservation of it. And it, basically the second law of thermodynamics is heat energy flows at a high heat to a low heat. So it always moves from hot to cold. And you can't stop this process. You can, you can only slow it down or speed it up. So we like to get that advantage of that 12 to 15 degree temperature difference, either between the refrigerant circuit and the water circuit, or even the ground circuit and what the earth is. Because of those temperature differences help us transfer the heat efficiently such at higher levels. So refrigerant cycle, if anybody's familiar with the refrigerator, and how it gets cold is that all we do is remove the heat from the space. So an evaporator in your freezer, we're metering the refrigerant into a vapor. And as the vapor atomizes to a fine mist, it absorbs heat. It comes to the compressor and we compress that vapor into a high condensed gas and it goes to the condenser, but now it condenses back to a liquid. And as a liquid, the refrigerant rejects heat. And that, that was designed by Mr. Carrier himself. And that's basically this, how we, and then it, then it goes back to the, the liquid, goes back to the evaporator. It goes to a metering device, which is the TXV, which turns it again into a high uh, pressure vapor and, and it absorbs the heat again. It comes to the condenser and it goes just the cycle over and over. So here's like the heating cycle. We have a reversing valve. So your suction pressure comes to the compressor, you discharge through the desuperheater, and here's your coax coil, refrigerant circuit through your air coil, TXV meters it to our, our heat transfer there. And then in the cooling mode, it, it basically reverses now. We go back this way through the coax coil and back this way through our suction and through the discharge to get rid of the heat. And then we show a desuperheater superheater here hooked up to the water tank. And we like to actually use a buffer tank because in the summertime we could produce so much extra hot water heat. We like to buffer that and have it, have it available. So when it's available to use, it's basically free hot water during the summer. And in winter time, we're concentrating on heating the house to the point where there is heat left over to heat the hot water. So here's some of the loops and pictures of the loops. We do have a horizontal loop right here. And again, the average, you could do different styles of horizontal loops, the racetrack, you could do slinky, um, one pipe, two pipe, four pipe, all the way on up to six pipe. 
And then there's a vertical loop. This is what I have at my house that are 200 foot deep. So each circuit is 400 foot of three quarter inch plastic tubing. Pod loops, a lot of times they're using about 300 foot of coil pipe in per circuit. And then an extra one if they're using hot water generation just for the, the, the capacity wise. But it's kind of a rule of thumb. We do have programs to help size the plastic loop in the water, in the ground, to the, to the load that's in the house and the unit size properly. And then here they're showing an open loop in the corner and that's pulling water right up from the aquifer up through the unit and back out to the pond or to a pond or a, a reservoir. So our circuit usually is three quarter inch or one inch piping. They use in multiple trenches, usually about 10 to 12 feet apart. You do have a header pit close to the house where they use the, the header to connect the inch and a quarter pipe from the house to the to the to the three quarter inch. Equipment would be mounted in the basement. There's no outside unit, and then uh, supply and return on the on the from the house into the to the header area is usually about inch and a quarter, inch and a half. And again, they're using polyethylene tubing, high density pipe, SDR11. In all connection, they're using heat fusion at 500 degrees, and it, uh, it's it's a good way of of, of transferring and, and being leak proof and and so forth. Um, and it and it doesn't rot; it doesn't um, doesn't deteriorate in the earth. And then we got this is kind of like the reverse return header that we have out close to the house, where we have the unit uh, flowing the circuit here and how everything comes around and, and back to, re, to the reverse return setup. And then we also like to reduce in our headers out there as far as the size goes, depending on the length and how many circuits you have. So they started out here with two inch pipe coming from the home, down an inch and a quarter, down to three quarter, down to three quarter, and they got one, two, three, four, five different circuits set up. And again, you reduce down unlike most plumbing does. Horizontal loop, you can see a single pipe, a dual pipe, a two pipe, four pipe, and they could space those out a little bit better type of deal. Um, here they're showing again, stapled up against the sidewall and then laid flat also where they're laid three. This is gonna be a six pipe system where they lay three of them down, put a little earth on top and then bring the three back. And then here's a slinky loop that saves space. So you don't have to trench out as far and you'll still put in about 600 foot of tubing there. And it does a great job laying out in a mat style. Sometimes they've come in with a bulldozer and clean out a big area, maybe like a hundred foot by 40 foot and then lay these down in that area and then bury back over the top. Here uh, they are putting a, 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 a slinky loop together. They use plastic ties and sometimes have a jig and then they lay it down in the, and they'll roll it up into a ball and then come out and then roll it right out in the trench. And it's nice to have, you see moisture and water in the earth and that provides great uh, heat of extraction and, and heat uh, recovery. Water is great, again, for heat transfer. It works, a wet soil really helps transfer the heat. Then they do bores, directional bores. And that's a nice system too. They could get down deeper in the earth and not destroy your yard as much. You only have a couple different penetrations and then your header pit. And again, you could stay in one area and go out about 100, 150 feet. And then again, here's a horizontal pond loop with three different circuits hooked up. They'll use um, cinder blocks and tie that down and, and keep it to the bottom of the pond. Normally you like to see 12 to 15 foot of, of depth there. And near the bottom of that pond is usually all year round, as long as it freezes over, about 40 to 45 degrees. Here's a big commercial pond loop going in for like a school. And that looks, I bet you some of those headers there look like about six to eight inch on that, on the main headers there. Um, this is like, they use this a lot in the south. It's a stainless steel type uh, lake pond loop type heat exchanger and they'll float it in underneath a dock or out in the lake area. And then this is like a, the vertical loop and this is where they have the, the, the bottom U-bend there at the, uh, of the vertical 
bore. So they come in and do the direction or the, the vertical drilling and then go ahead and slip the loop down into the, and then come along and trench and connect that all up like a main header. So here's a closed loop set, uh, set up. You have your flow center and the water uh, tubing going to your loop. And then it comes into our unit and then back out to the loop. You do have, uh, again, um, uh, disconnects for your electric. We do show uh, electric uh, strip heater in the unit for backup auxiliary. And they do have recommend flexible collars for quietness on both sheet metal connections and on your supply and returns. Um, in the freezing, climate areas we like to use again antifreeze and there is a few different types we have a, a vironol product that's safe for the environment methanol and that's a uh, again diluted is very safe and then properly propylene glycol which they have used that in the past but it seems to sludge up a little bit and it is a food grade and safe and all that and it does work but we seem to have better results with environmental and methanol. Uh, flushing and filling. So they come in with a fill cart and a flush cart and they'll go in and use, uh, try to use good fil filtered clean water. A lot of times on a job site, if it's a new home, we don't know and for sure what type of well water they have. And it could be hard, it could be minerals. We don't want to use that. And actually when I did my last system, I actually went and bought 80 gallons of water from Myers for 80 cents a gallon to know that I had good distilled water going in my, my system. So, and they figured it out by the size of my tubing, three quarter piping and an inch and a quarter and how many gallons of water he needed with the 10 gallons of methanol and it worked out just fine. So here's an open loop installation where they're showing just the piping coming in in a pump and dump situation going out. And again, there's advantages of an open loop over in a closed loop. Open loop is using your 230 volt wellhead pump and circulating about 2.5 million gallons a year through your unit, where a closed loop is using a small fractional horsepower type motor and, and circulates through a closed loop system and doesn't have as much maintenance either. So water supply for open loop, they say 1.5 gallon uh, per minute and I, I like to recommend two here in Michigan and then again they're showing how they're pulling it up here and bringing it back into a pond or um, different ways of, of, of setting up a, a, of a pump and dump system. So key benefits of geothermal it's energy savings heating and cooling it's quiet no outdoor condensing unit less maintenance long life the average lifespan in the AHRI ratings is 25 years Safe, clean, no flames, no fumes, no flues, no carbon monoxide. It's very environmentally friendly. And it does uh, reduce peak demand for the summer months on the electric power grid. And it is a huge benefit for them. Um, other applications, we're growing considerably in the commercial markets now, along with the government markets. They're doing a lot more on government bases and buildings and uh, municipalities and so forth. Schools have been doing it for a while. We got some condo projects in Detroit area and Grand Rapids that have been installed, I would say 18 to 25 years ago, because I'm starting to replace some of those units now, which are pretty, pretty nice to know that they've been doing it for a long time. And those systems, by the way, could use a boiler and a water tower as part of their closed loop system. So in a city situation where you're not able to put a loop in the ground and do a vertical bore or, or access, they'll, they'll install a boiler and a cooling tower in order in, in conjunction with the geothermal to maintain um, their loop setup type deal. But also we could do pools and spas and heat water that way, but we gotta be careful with chlorine or or ever chemicals that are might be in the water. Um, so they use a separate heat exchanger or a stainless steel or titanium. We have, we've done snow melt and ice melt and radiant floor heating. Um, so we are the most environmentally and energy efficient, clean and cost effective for heating and cooling. 
EPA is starting to recognize that. We're starting to get more support through the government and so forth and reduce anywhere our, our uh, emissions 40% to an air source heat pump and 70 cents over electric resistant heating. So they're saying here for one in 12 California homes installed the geo exchange system, the energy savings would equal nine new power plants. And installing a geo exchange system in typical home is equal to uh, greenhouse gas reduction of planting an acre of trees. Um, current geo exchange installations equal 14 million barrels of crude oil uh, saved per year. And the ground absorbs 47% of the sun's energy that reaches the earth. And that represents 500 more than mankind needs every year. So uh, again, energy on the earth receives from the sun in one hour res represents more energy than humanity requires in one year. Preventative maintenance on our system. Quarterly, we like to check host connections for leak or vibration or noise, fan belts, wear and tension. And we're not using any fan belts any longer, by the way, with direct drive motors, uh, lubricate in the blowers and so forth, change your uh, filter. Um, quarterly maintenance, I mean, st standard, I, on my unit, I'm just basically once a year changing the air filter and checking, uh, uh, changing from humidifier and uh, off, you know, for the heating and cooling season. Um, so I've been very, again, not a whole lot of maintenance required if it's running and operating properly. Um, in the first year of operation, a lot of times they like to go and, and double check and, um, and um, pressurize and come back and repressurize the loop because sometimes the plastic will expand during the heating season and then contract a little bit where you need to put maybe just a one or two gallons into the, into the loop. Um, again, very just checking for leaks or excessive uh, uh, drips or anything around the, the system itself. We do also have something that can be mounted with your loop. It's called a um, FC reservoir, and it has a sight glass on there, so you can actually visualize and see your water level of the loop and make sure it's proper. So not a whole lot of uh, lot of work. Um, we're two questions now. Anybody that might have some questions? Wilford, is that is. Uh, how much, what's the minimum land that you would need, to, I guess, for a, a vertical system? I mean, that, you know, if you didn't have much land, you, I still could, you could do it in all kinds of just long, you have a little bit of land, or how much, what's the rule, is there a rule of thumb, and, uh, you know, rule of thumb of how you size the system in terms of the size of the insulation of the, of the, your, your, your uh, building? Well, my vertical system, I have a lot out front, Basically, it's your post posted stamp size suburban lot. It's mine's a little bigger though. It's 200 foot across the front, and about 158 feet deep on one side and 200 foot on the other. And um, and that loop is right out in front of my yard here because I had septic system in the backyard, and that only took is they spaced those vertical spacing out about 12 foot a piece. So there was five vertical bores. I needed about 60 foot across the front of my yard and about maybe 15 to 20 feet away from the structure. As far as that goes, that, and again, depending, we're gonna be getting involved with a program in Ann Arbor that uh, Viridian County Country Farms, and they're gonna be smaller homes, about uh, 12 to 1800 square foot. And they're planning on putting two vertical bores in under the garage floor area and then going in through the sidewall to connect to the units. So they were gonna maintain and, and, and cover their loop right in the, the garage floor area and then just go right into the sidewall into the basement to the mechanical room. Hey, Alan, why don't you stop your screen sharing? It might be easier to see people uh when they want okay. to ask questions. There you go, there you how's go. that? Thank you. If, if you want to have a question, ask a question, just unmute yourself and go ahead. I was, uh, this is Karen. 
I was wondering if there's any particular climate where this isn't a good option, like in a desert or something? No, in fact, we're really big down now in, in like Texas and the cooling areas, even though it's drier soil, Oklahoma, yes, they do have some areas that are drier or even in Michigan, by the way, when I get up in the thumb area along the Lake Huron shoreline, that's really sandy area and it doesn't have heavy clay, wet soil. So they're actually putting 800 foot of tubing. They're putting extra tubing in the ground to help, help that heat transfer. Where again, heavy wet clay soil is, makes really good heat transfer for the loop. We're a dry sandy type condition. So when we're, we have a program called GeoLink and I could put that data in there, what type of soil we have. And if it's, if we're doing vertical, horizontal, slinky, I could put all the different types of loops available. And then I can calculate what type of BTU capacity that loop will provide on the home. And I know the question earlier was, how do you size that? So normally we try to get a BTU loss, heat loss and heat gain of the home. And then we go and we'll size the unit to that. And then we size the loop field to the unit to maintain the, the temperatures. And when I'm doing that on a program, we're looking at some bin data and it will run the beam data. And it, it based on, by the way, AHR numbers. So like right in our area here across the state of Michigan in the, you know, I'd say from Detroit across like 94 basically, we calculate a winter degree day, worst condition of zero degrees, and in the summertime at 90 degrees. And they'll size and, and do your load calculations of your home of those extreme conditions. And then we go ahead and size the loop to the similar conditions. And then we also like to say, hey, by the way, when we get down to about 12 degrees outdoor temperature, we're gonna start have to bring in a little extra resistant heat to maintain the, the, the loop because as the winter goes on, the heat, we, we pull so much heat from the ground, our loop temperatures get a lower. So I wanna go back to earlier, the advantage of an open loop system, a pump and dump, you're always having 50, 52 degree water going through your system and always has great transfer for you. During the winter time, we might start out, my loop right now is probably around 50, 55, 60 degrees out there. But as I start using it for the heating season, I saw my loop get down to 35 degrees temperature. But then as it warmed up a little bit and, uh, and it ran less, as the unit ran less, my loop came back up to 41 degrees. So there's your renewable energy and, and, and absorbing that earth temperature. And, but it, mines the vertical bores and I'm hitting the aquifer down and below, which gives us better heat. You might feel like, yeah, you're going to get, we just got more constant temperature at a more median rate where a horizontal loop might fluctuate a little bit more, but still it's more efficient at the most extreme level. So like if you had an air to air heat pump, and it's, it's 20 below out blowing and cold, you need it to be the most efficient. And at that point, it's really working hard to pull any heat out of the air where the earth and the temperature there will be 35, 40 degrees. And it will be always constant temperature and easy to transfer the heat. Alan, this is John. Yes. What is the typical ballpark price for these systems for its typical size house? Well, depending on the loop. Now, if you do vertical loop, it costs a little bit more because you're getting a, a well driller involved and bringing a big rig out to drill the, the loop. A contractor that does horizontal loop will just use a small excavator uh, and you know do his own digging and lay the trench and, and go ahead and put the piping in. So a geothermal system, basically the, the, the heat pump itself that mounts in the basement, that's your furnace, it's basically the same cost of a furnace and air conditioning combined. The added cost is putting the loop in the ground. So I'm going to say it's around 20 grand to 25 grand, depending where you're at, depending um, again, the size and the, the scope of the job of, of what has to be done. But currently the federal government gives us a 26% tax credit. 
and then next year it drops to 22 percent and we're fighting diligently just like our other industries are to hopefully extend our credits and and move forward with that it, it has been a um you know it is it does help for instance at my home here five six years ago i had a gas furnace lennox pulse with outdoor air conditioner so if i went with a new system the top of the line furnace and the top of the line air to air heat pump through my buddy at the wholesale house who I used to work for, my cost on that equipment was around eight grand. And if you had a contractor come and put it in, it's gonna be probably around 14 grand. So my geothermal was 24 grand and the minus tax credit was around, came to around 16 or 17 grand. And it only, I've been saving probably about $800 a, a year in energy and cost of gas and, um, Probably only took me about three to four years to make up that difference from a conventional gas furnace and air conditioner to the geothermal heat pump system. And again, the tax credit helped considerably to help us get us into a level playing field. Hey, Alan, you uh, uh, you know the uh, the loop system uh, I assume kind of lasts forever. But uh, uh, what's a typical life for the the heat pump part of the system? Uh, you mentioned the warranty, but I'm wondering what's the uh, a typical life for a system, a heat pump. Well, our, actually, it I didn't replace. AHRI says 25 years. So if you look up the American Heat uh, Refrigeration Institute data, they say 24 to 25 years for a, a heat pump. And reason being, it's installed in the basement, it's in, or in a in, inside the home, or inside a crawl space, or it's not being weathered. A gas appliance when it combusts, when you're taking gas and creating combustion. It creates uh, all kinds of poisonous gases for one, but also acids from the conden condensation. And a lot of furnaces just rot away. Our propane is very corrosive when it burns. So you see in burners and heat exchangers and the furnaces just don't seem to last as long because again, that, that's their own little power plant. And they're actually creating heat and, and there's uh, the products of combustions are very, uh, very acidic really so again a furnace might last 10 to 12 you know up to 20 years back in the days i'm going to say those old tanks would last 20 years also but again you're losing efficiency and and uh, you're still putting some of your energy up the chimney and then outdoor air conditioner i was in the wholesale business for close to 30 years and i remember selling a lot of air conditioners that were then being replaced or heat pumps even worse because Air to air heat pumps work so much harder during the winter time and, and they seem to go with compressors and they would only last, I would say, eight to 10 years on an air to air heat pump and an air conditioner outdoors is probably 12 to 15 years. And then a geo unit, again, 25 years. So when you're looking at cost, and yeah, we are a little high on the, on the in, in install and upfront cost, but in the long run, our geo unit's going to last longer than an air-to-air -air or a furnace. And you probably have to replace two of those to one of ours. And then also our loop. Now, if you had to go back and now replace the geo after 25 years, you have no loop cost involved. And, and you're going to build uh, some equity in that loop. And it won't cost as much for your second geo system around. So... Again, it, it in the long run, yeah, it's it's a good thing. And doing more beneficial electrification and doing more homes all, all electric, geothermal really helps fit the bill. So how how much the 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 heat pump unit is using electricity to push water through the ground, correct? Yeah, well, it's circulating okay. through a so, plastic. Well, how much energy does the pump take in order to push water through? I mean, is it a well, very small fraction of? Yeah, it's a it's a small fractional horsepower pump, like a a, a one twentieth horsepower pump, and we do have data on that. So on a regular standard pump, usually in a four ton system, might actually have two pumps side by side in the flow center. Okay. That usually would run probably around $200 a year in electric cost. But when we go to a ver variable speed,
pumps now and they're using those more and more and we have a variable speed compressor unit which is using a lot less energy than, than a standard uh, compressor. Those, that flow center only costs around 80 to 120 on the, on the program. So uh, 80 to hundred dollars, you know, or $120 to run that pump. And we have really good data, by the way, we actually are recording and monitoring all our data now right through the unit itself and able to keep track of the, kilowatt hours and everything separately of our unit. It's pretty neat, actually. It's called the symphony system. But then basically, we don't need gas anymore. <laughs> no, no. In fact, um, DTE, I've been working with a, the gas side of their industry up in the thumb area where they would like to start putting in a loop program for their electric customers because they know it doesn't cost, it costs them too much to run gas line. You know, right. there's only a house every every country mile so if they gotta run they gotta run eight miles of gas line to tap into eight houses it's not gonna be cost effective for them. So they want to come up with a loop leasing program or some type of program to put the loop in the ground for the customer and maybe charge them back on their utility bill and have them pay for it that way. So the bottom line is that you save natural gas from heating in the winter and then you save electricity from air conditioning in the summer. Yes, very much so. In fact, my cooling bill in the summer on my house here, and I'm sorry, to, I used to brag it was around $25 a month, but last, this past year, our electrics had gone up to 16 cents a kilowatt hour with AEP. And I'm gonna say I average around $35 a month now for my cooling cost. Where I've talked to other people, they said, what? Man, my bill was over 150 more than it usually was, you know? so. They really pay higher electric on that on that cooling, you know, um, and it and a lot has to do with again with an air conditioner. It's outside, it's ninety degrees outside, and we're trying to get rid of heat out of your house in ninety degree ambient weather. So it's it's not very efficient. As soon as we go to the ground, that ground temp. I never seen my loop get hotter than sixty five degrees in the winter during the summertime. So that hot air that we're transferring the heat. To that water it just disappears real quick down there in the ground and it kind of regenerates the earth a little bit so when it does come to heating season there's heat there for us to get started you know hey alan uh you know if you build a new home uh, how much do you save in because you you avoid the cost of the natural gas connections uh, in those pipes if you go sure. all electric uh, do you know approximately how much you save on just the uh, natural gas connection costs you know what, that's huge, by the way, and it has come into play on some of our applications where over here in Berrien Springs, the guy's house was so far off the road, they want to charge him $10,000 to bring up the gas line up to his, from the road to his house. That's the cost of the loop, basically. And now you don't have, like you say, you don't have gas piping in the house, you know, because there's a cost of that now, and not depending on what product they use. They could use the black iron pipe. They could use a stainless steel, like a flex pipe now called track pipe. Um, that could run into a, a few thousand dollars for sure to gas pipe a house. And and again, to, you don't have to worry about carbon monoxide poisoning any longer. You don't have to worry about any gas explosion. You know, um, in the cost of natural gas has been fairly cheap, inexpensive, um, but I don't think you're gonna see that forever. In fact, I just saw, I think here in the last few months, they were talking about having a, uh, about a 12 or 15% increase through consumers, you know, and trying to get their gas to go up. So they're all going up, but again, anywhere uh, electric, front, like a gas appliance is only gonna be most efficient about 98%. So you're still losing a couple percent electric, geothermal unit is going to be anywhere from three to 500 percent more efficient depending on what application what size unit what loop what water what we're using but mostly i just gave some numbers to a guy today our coefficients of performance was at 4.5 so that's 450 times higher than than a gas appliance efficiency wise so every unit ever in energy of electric we get four and a half more. So if you come to my geo gas station and buy a gallon of geo gas, I'm going to pump you about five. That's a pretty good deal. But that's, 
that's kind of the basics of geothermal and it is pretty basic. And um, I'm very blessed to be with a company like Water Furnace that we've been very innovative and come up with some variable speed compressors, uh, their, their Wi-Fi capability of, of monitoring now and be able to provide data and showing uh, case studies and stuff like that to the power companies that how efficient we really are. Uh, Alan, I have a, qu a question. I'm going to play devil's advocate just for a second. <laughs> but just a thought experiment. If someone, if someone had a very, you know, kind of a small house, you know, kind of smaller house, but it was super, super tight, is there, is there any uh, advantage when it comes to a time where you might be better off going in air air exchange if it was yeah, so I'm like, I'm like, I'd have to agree with that. And DTE did a survey here a couple of years ago that I was involved with, and I helped them price out some equipment. And we were comparing the prices of geothermal units to like a carrier Xfinity unit, one of their high dollar top of the line furnaces in here. And with the geo price and their price. And when they came down to a house, like you said, 1,500 square foot and smaller in their area with the small post type lot, they would say, yes, it might be more advantageous to put in a little air-to-air -air mini split or a, or a high efficiency, uh, like you say, uh, some of those units that would, you know, an air-to-air -air product would fit in that cir circumstances a little bit better because of the added cost of the loop and then the energy savings is not as great, you know, over time, it takes a little bit longer if your energy savings is only gonna be, you know, half of a 3000 square foot home. So, um, but in the long run, they still find a lot of areas that would benefit their power grid considerably by going geo, for sure. Larry, this, Alan, this is John again. Yes. Do you have you all developed like a software where you could plug a home a person who is contemplating geothermal could plug in what their typical electric bill is in the summer for air conditioning and what their typical you know gas bill is in the winter for heating and then they could plug in the cost of a geothermal system and then you could therefore calculate how long it would take to pay back the system yes is that we something have, that all the, your salespeople have developed or something? Yes, yes, we have that. It's called the GeoLink program. So I can I can show you, um, I can go through and show you like the seven series, our variable speed unit. I can show you the five series, which is our two stage unit. And then I can show you like an air to air heat pump with a 98% furnace. And then I can show you just a standard air conditioner with like a 95% furnace. And that would calculate as long as I put in the cost of the correct cost of 16 cents a kilowatt hour, maybe 70 cents per uh, uh, CCF for gas, or if it was propane, like a buck 60 for propane, or if it was oil, that'd be like 250 a gallon. So I could put all those data in there and it would actually print out exactly what the cost of my each unit with the savings of our annual cost of operating that unit and the difference between each one. And let alone then with our Symphony Wi-Fi program that's monitoring our systems now that have been out, we have over 7,000 out across the country that have been installed over a year. And that data that they've been recording and monitoring and, and they go up against the GeoLink program is within 1% of accuracy. So it's very accurate now. They, they, they're just so pleased about that. But they don't know that. So if you go to Water Furnace's website, you can go in to the residential and then you click on, there's a, they call a savings calculator. And you put in your address and they're gonna take the data from your, from Zoom or what is that? There's a, there's a company, um, not Zoom, but a- Zillow? Zillow, yeah. So Zillow, has information in there about your home that's been there for let's say 25 years. Well, they're gonna take your, your tax data and say, well, that house is 2,400 square foot. That house was built in 1995. That, that, uh, that, and they're gonna calculate almost to the T of what, you're in, what size unit energy and everything else you need. But then if you say, hey, you click, I'm on, I'm on natural gas or you're on propane, 
they will go ahead and they'll give you a number and say, you'll probably save around $850 per year over natural gas, or you might save 2000 a year over propane. And those numbers should be fairly accurate. And by the way, they like to be very conservative, conservative, because they don't like to overstretch their bounds. this you know so it is it, it is a nice program and and um and, and, and working with my dealers a little bit they can play with it too by increasing loop size or different types of earth or you know that all affects all that stuff for us but it gives us protection or it gives us a sense of stability of making sure we're doing it right that's the whole thing. We don't like a bad apple out there. I think we have time for maybe one or maybe two more questions. Does anybody have any more questions uh, for Alan? Yeah. Yeah, this, this, this is John Gorley. Uh, I have a question. Um, uh, have you had any experience, Alan, with uh, in installing a system to run uh, powered from a uh, solar battery system? You know, that, it, it depends now. And I've been, I use 1600, I, on my electric bill every month, I'm averaging right around that 1600 kWh. So depending on the size of the system and so forth. I'm gonna let you know though, we've come a long way with our, even our standard type compressors or scroll compressors, a four ton unit, Standard lock rotor amps and startup would be around 110 amps. We put on an IntelliStart. They call it IntelliStart. It's a soft starter type uh, solid state little compressor uh, soft starter. And that drops your lock rotor amps to around 35. So that really helps considerably, even if you had a generator that you were powering, let's say you lost power and you had a generator come on and you had to bring a generator on, online it helps lower your size of generator considerably. Instead of a 20 kWh generator, you might be able to put in a, a 14 kWh, you know, um, because of the lower amp draw on that, on startup. Now we came out with a seven series variable speed compressor, and that is 10 amps on startup. That's phenomenal. That's less than most vacuum cleaners. And, and the way of variable speeds, I've never seen my unit get up into that 10 or 12 or the, the high speed of 10, other than maybe that polar vortex we had. But I'm always seeing my system operating in one and two compressor speed, maintaining temperature. It's like, it's like getting on cruise control. And once you get your temperature there, it doesn't take much energy to maintain it. And it, that's what makes that variable speed very, that goes up to five plus 5.1, 5.2 COP. That's the most energy efficient of them all. So yeah. So you've uh, answered my next question already, which was what the uh, startup currents are for the compressor. Um, yeah. I'm asking because I have a, a battery backup uh, solar system. Right now it's not connected to my geothermal but I might like to sometime in the future. And so I'm trying to get a sense of what it's gonna take. And John Doner, who spoke last week, uh, had exactly the same question. Uh, so, so these numbers are, uh, are, are useful, thanks. But no, that, and, it, and if you ever need any help on the data, um, Water Furnace's website is just easy to maneuver and get to. Let's say you go to waterfurnace.com, you click on residential, and then you could click on, let's say the five series, well, then there's a spot there for literature, specs, and, and, um, and installation guidelines. So I think within three to four clicks, you could actually get to the specs of that unit and see exactly uh, what, what's needed to, to maintain and your electric and so forth. But like I said, um, some of the winter months, not putting out as much sun as we need to. And, you know, I don't know what size battery capacity you want to have, but, it, you know, how if you're using i don't know how, uh, the size i mean the lithium battery they're coming a long way don't get me wrong but i'm not sure your storage capacity and how long it might run the geo for one day maybe you know uh, 12 would it make it through the night till the next day till we got sun again i would hope so 
<laughs> well, I do have one more question, which is um, when, when, you're, when you quote those uh, 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 startup uh, currents, 110 amps or 35 amps or whatever you said, um, how long does that last? Uh, how long does how long does that really high current draw last before? Oh, it drops just a millisecond. Down? Just a millis. That's that's the main rush just, just to get the compressor going, and then just a millisecond. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just okay. a very short, very short. Uh, hang on a second. Let me take a peek at something real quick. I was just looking at electrical specs earlier today. Five series installation. I can actually probably even share electrical data uh, right here. here. I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna show. I'm gonna share screen real quick with you. Uh, this is it right here. Can you see that? Yep, yeah, we can now. Okay. So here's a dual capacity unit up here with variable speed ECM motor. So that's a that's one, and then with the below is a five-speed motor. So let's go to a four-ton unit at 230 single phase, um, showing the, the run load amps at 21.1, locked rotor at 104, and then with the with the IntelliStart drops that down to 37. So they're showing then as I go across. Minimum amp capacity would be a circuit size of 50 amps to maintain that unit. Okay, and does this tell you how long uh, it'll uh, it'll pull 37 amps before uh, uh, it drops down to the uh, running? Oh, it, again, amps? It, it's quick. It's a quick milliseconds. It, once it once it rushes in and gets the compressor running and operating. It dropped right down the run mode amps at that 21.1. But as you can see, if you had a smaller house and you had a two ton system, your run load amps there is only 11.6, not very hard at all, you know. But that's that's on a two stage. Let me, yeah, so that gives you an idea though on your on a capacity and then a five speed ECM it really don't change much, especially on the compressor. It will go on the blower here. So the blower amps are a little bit, uh, a little higher on the five speed ECM. And you're seeing us do a lot more direct drive and a lot less, or I'm gonna stop sharing, but a lot less, um, we're using a lot more ECM variable speed driven motors also, which is helping considerably on your electrical consumption for sure. Well, hey, thank you, Alan. Uh, this has been very helpful, I think, because you've you shared a lot of very valuable information. And boy, there's a, a lot of interest, I know, in geothermal these days and also in uh, all electrification of homes, which obviously uh, heat pumps have to play an important part in. So, uh, hey, thank you for sharing all this information. Uh, do we have thank any you, uh, final comments by anybody? I'd like to say thank you for having me, though, and I greatly appreciate it. And Looking forward to continue to stay on the board here with uh, Great Lakes Renewable Energy Association. And I'm also vice president on the Michigan Geothermal Energy Association. And having these groups together and doing the zero, the net zero energy conferences and getting together and doing these things is just huge for our industry and help build awareness and continue to um, become carbon free. Yeah. Hey, thank you again, Alan. And thank, thank you to everybody for participating. Take care. Thank you again.